I'm going to tell you a story. I believe it's a story of progress. You'll have to make up your own minds about that. It's a story that begins in Brazil in the year 1882 with the arrival of Christopher Columbus. Not that Christopher Columbus. This Christopher Columbus. This is Christopher Columbus Andrews. And in 1882, he takes up residence in Rio to begin a three-year term as the US Consul General to Brazil. In 1887, Andrews writes a book based on his experience in which he devotes an entire chapter to his, a detailed description of his visit to a coffee plantation. As he arrives on the plantation and gets a look at the buildings, he estimates that the farm depends on a permanent labor force of somewhere between 500 and 600 slaves. As you may know, Brazil was the last country in the Americas to abolish slavery, which it didn't do until 1888, three years after Andrews left the country. Later in the book, Andrews takes on the topic of slavery, and he evaluates the performance of the country's emancipation fund. This was a federal fund set up in 1871 to buy the freedom of slaves from their owners. It was one of a series of measures implemented over a period of almost 60 years to bring about a controlled, gradual abolition of slavery in Brazil. And according to Andrews, the fund is working, but it's working very slowly, freeing fewer than 2,000 people a year. At that rate, Andrews estimates, it is likely that Americans will drink coffee produced by slave labor for at least a quarter of a century longer. When I read that line, I tried to imagine what Andrews would think if he learned that not a quarter of a century later, but more than a century and a quarter later, we still are. In the summer of 2013, we stumbled on to this, a list of 15 coffee farms found by inspectors at Brazil's Ministry of Labor to be employing workers under what the country's laws call conditions analogous to slavery. Obviously, that was a shocking revelation, and it raised lots of questions, including some pretty basic ones like, what does that even mean, slavery in 2013 in Brazil? What's the scope of the problem? Is it just these 15 farms, or are they indicative of a broader reality? And if so, how big is that reality? What does it look like? And most importantly, what can be done about it? For answers to those questions, we turn to a longtime partner called Reporter Brazil. Today, we publish their answers to those questions in a report that's available in the Recro Symposium bookstore on the CRS website and our Coffee Lands blog. Those answers are central to my story, but before I get to them, I think it's important to reflect a little bit on the unique resonance in Brazil of the S word. The Atlantic slave trade left a ruinous legacy in its wake everywhere. Uh, in this country, more than 150 years after abolition, we're still dealing with that legacy. But I think it's fair to say that uh, slavery had a unique impact on Brazil, and a few numbers will help to show you why. The first historical records of African slaves brought to Brazilian seaport states to 1538. That means that the institution of slavery thrived in Brazil for 350 years. Historians estimate that somewhere between three and five million Africans were brought to Brazil through the slave trade, mostly from the Portuguese colonies of Angola and Mozambique, which means that somewhere between 30 and 50% of all Africans ensnared in the Atlantic slave trade were destined for Brazil. And today, Brazil has the highest population of Afro-descended people anywhere in the world outside the continent of Africa. And in the 19th century, the trade in Brazilian coffee and the trade in African people were inextricably bound together. As Brazil rose to a commanding position in the world's coffee economy, the growth of the coffee sector drove slavery, and slavery drove the growth of the coffee sector. What did it look like? Well, thanks to a bit of historical serendipity, the late years of slavery in Brazil coincided with the early years of photography. So we can look across space and through time into the eyes of African slaves in Brazilian coffee fields in the 19th century. What was life like for these people? To borrow from the philosopher Thomas Hobbes, it tended to be nasty, brutish, and short. A chronicler of Andrew's era said that these wretched slaves are pushed beyond the limits of physical endurance and end their days in a brief time. Another suggested that it was precisely the rate of labor exploitation of slaves that helped propel Brazil's coffee economy to the commanding position it assumed in the 19th century. So in 1940, 
when the country's leaders decide to enshrine the S word in the country's penal code, in this prohibition on reducing anyone to a condition analogous to that of a slave, it's not because they're being careless with their language, and it's not because they don't know what slavery looks like. They're being intentional with their language, and they know all too well what slavery looks like. Because images like this one are seared into Brazil's collective imagination. But that was then. What about now? What does slavery mean in Brazil in 2016? The answer to that question starts to come into focus around 1995, when the country's government reluctantly acknowledges the existence of modern slavery. It's an acknowledgement that's the product of 20 years of campaigning by human rights organizations, including our partners in the Catholic Church in Brazil. And it's an acknowledgement that initiates a period of 10 years of extraordinary innovation to create a national campaign to eradicate slave labor. It's a campaign that is comprehensive, cross-sectoral, courageous, and creative. It's a campaign that's won accolades from the UN's International Labor Organization, the US Department of Labor, and neo-abolitionist groups like Free the Slaves and Walk Free Foundation. That same year, Brazil creates the Special Mobile Inspection Group, housed in the Ministry of Labor and charged with enforcing compliance with Article 149. Its inspectors make surprise visits to factories, farms, and firms believed to be employing workers under conditions analogous to slavery. And when it finds them, it sets them free. To date, the Special Mobile Inspection Group has rescued over 50,000 workers from uh, precarious labor conditions in Brazil. In 2003, the country creates the Dirty List. This is a public registry of employers found by the Special Mobile Inspection Group to be in violation of Article 149. Employers, including those 15 farms that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, who are on the list stay there for two years. During that time, they are ineligible for federal funding, and if you'll pardon the term, blacklisted by select private financial institutions. They also see their trading relationships curtailed across the board. And finally, in 2005, Brazil creates the National Pact to Eradicate Slave Labor. It's a platform for permanent private sector engagement with firms committed to eradicating slave labor from their supply chains. But what does it mean? What does slavery mean? Well, in 2003, eight years after the creation of the Special Mobile Inspection Group, and armed with the knowledge that came from eight years of casework, eight years of muddy boots in the field insights, Brazil decides to amplify Article 149 to more fully explicate what conditions analogous to slavery look like in 2003, and they come up with four conditions. Forced labor, debilitating work days, <coughs> degrading working conditions, and debt bondage, or using debt to limit a worker's mobility. That's what slavery means in Brazil in 2016. What's the scope of the problem? When we asked Reporter Brazil how many coffee farms are employing workers under conditions analogous to slavery? They said something like, mm, we don't know. There were two things that were very clear, however. First, it was clear that the dirty list very likely underreports the real incidence of what Brazil calls modern slavery. The country simply does not have the wherewithal to follow up on every allegation, however credible, of slave labor in the coffee supply chain. The other thing that was clear is that there is no slavery epidemic in Brazil. The Dan Watch report that Kim Elena mentioned quoted an ILO official who said that if we could follow up on all the allegations, there may be two to three times as many cases of slave labor on the books. Even two to three times 15 is intolerably high, but it's hardly an epidemic when you're talking about a country with more than 360,000 farms. What does slavery look like? Well. Those 15 farms that we asked Reporter Brazil to investigate were on the list for a reason. Inspectors from the Special Mobile Inspection Group found evidence of at least one of the four conditions in Article 149, forced labor. There were workers who were unable to leave their farms because they were under the menace of penalty. And on at least one farm, workers reported being victims of physical violence. Debt bondage. One in every three farms use debt to keep workers on the farm against their will. These are debts that were incurred for miserable food, squalid housing, precarious transport. Debilitating work days. We're not talking here about mere overtime. We're talking about a systematic pattern of working days that have adverse, long-term, potentially irreversible impacts on worker health and safety. Degrading working conditions. 
yielding to the wisdom of the relative power of pictures and words, we'll let you see for yourselves just a few pictures taken by labor inspectors on the 15 farms on that version of the dirty list that formed the basis of our research. It's not pretty, but is it slavery? For an answer to that question, we need to go to Bellagio. Not that Bellagio. The real Bellagio in Italy. It was there and on the campus of Harvard University that the Rockefeller Foundation gathered the world's foremost experts on the topic of slavery to wrestle with some of these persistent definitional issues. What they produced is known as the Harvard Bellagio Guidelines on the Legal Parameters of Slavery. How does it stack up to Brazil's definition? Well, the experts do talk about forced labor, but they do not equate it with slavery. They consider it a condition that can lead to slavery when left unchecked. They also talk about debt bondage, but they don't call its victims slaves. They call them persons of servile status. They make no mention of debilitating work days or degrading working conditions. And indeed, a few weeks ago, I spoke with one of the authors of the Harvard Bellagio guidelines, and he told me that for him personally, yeah, Brazil does apply the term slavery to conditions that he personally would not as an expert. And in fact, these last two conditions have been challenged in Brazil by critics of Article 149 and the country's approach to modern slavery. Today, there's a bill in Brazil's Congress which proposes eliminating debilitating workdays and degrading working conditions from Article 149 on the grounds that they are inherently subjective. So the question persists, is it slavery? The question I pose to you today is, how much does it really matter? In recent years, governments around the world have raised the bar on transparency and supply chains and lowered the boom on slavery and related practices like human trafficking. Starting in Sacramento, where the California Senate passed Senate Bill 657, the California Transparency in Supply Chains Act. This act, as many of you know, and some of you have been forced to comply with, obligates companies with over $100 million in annual global revenues to make annual public disclosure of the policies and practices they've put in place to keep slavery and trafficking out of their supply chains. Last year, the UK passed the Modern Slavery Act, which also includes compulsory reporting requirements and includes uh, strict penalties for people found guilty. And in January, the Obama administration in Washington signed into law the Trade Facilitation and Trade Enforcement Act of 2015, also known as the Customs Bill. The Customs Bill eliminates an obscure 85-year-old loophole known as the consumptive demand exception, which exempted coffee and other products from the country's prohibition on the import of goods tainted with slave or unfree labor. Whether or not you agree personally or professionally or corporately with Brazil's definition of slavery, it is the law of the land, and it, laws like this will make it very relevant to your supply chain operations. So let's go back to Brazil with a quick stop in Panama, where in 2014, the opening session of the Let's Talk Coffee event was devoted to the state of specialty. It included both Rick Reinhardt and Carlos Brando, whose sterling pedigree makes him an unofficial ambassador of Brazilian coffee. Rick began the conversation talking about policy and the importance of policy in determining who participates in the coffee trade and how. At the end of the session, a Brazilian grower stood up and asked a question. He said, isn't it true that the strict environmental and labor protections in place in Brazil make us less competitive vis-a-vis -vis our neighbors? And Carlos did not waste a moment in coming back and saying, they don't make you less competitive, they make you more sustainable. For me, the clear implication was, let's not roll back the protections, let's figure out how to use those protections to your advantage in a marketplace that wants more transparency, that wants more information about the social and environmental conditions under which their coffee is produced. And Rick didn't waste a minute in adding, it's not that Brazil does too much, it's that everyone else does too little. So I want to be really clear on this point. From my perspective, Brazil is the good guy. That may be a hard message to square with the images that I've showed you, but the only reason we have access to that information is that Brazil has married a tenacious commitment to protect workers with an equally deep commitment to transparency. What should we do with this information? Here's what we shouldn't do. We should not lean away from Brazilian coffee. We should lean in.
at a time when regulators and consumers are asking us for more information about the sources of our coffee, Brazil's providing that. They've spent 20 years building programs, policies, and procedures to give you the information you need to comply with the law and to meet your consumers' rising standards for transparency. Don't punish Brazil for telling the truth. Reward it. If we punish Brazil for telling the truth, we will succeed in excluding uncomfortable words like slavery from the conversation, but we won't do anything to change the conditions on the ground, and every other country around the world will take cues from that and be sure not to be transparent. Brazil doesn't have worse labor conditions than other coffee-producing countries. It likely has stronger labor protections, deeper commitment to transparency. For better or worse, it has the S word, and it has tools that we can use to begin this work together to eliminate those last 15 or 30 or 45 cases. One of those tools is the National Pact to Eradicate Slave Labor. Over the last 10 years, its principles have been embraced by hundreds of companies, including leading Brazilian firms and Brazilian subsidiaries of leading global brands like Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Unilever, Walmart, but no coffee companies. Not a single coffee company has signed on to the pact. Brazil also has Article 149. As I mentioned, it is being challenged. So we have that for the time being. It is an important tool. The dirty list was suspended in 2014. A uh, powerful lobby for the construction industry filed an injunction with the Supreme Court, which ruled that indeed the dirty list had problems with due process and declared it unconstitutional. So the dirty list is no longer around. But Brazil's commitment to transparency is so deep that our partners at Reporter Brazil and the Institute for the National Pact to Eradicate Slave Labor filed the Brazilian equivalent of a Freedom of Information Act request and got access to the information on which the dirty list has been based. They publish what we call an unofficial official list, that is, a list based on official data but not published by an official agency. They call it the Transparency List of Slave Labor and we're working now with Reporter Brazil to make that information more accessible and more actionable for this community. So let's start working together in Brazil on this issue. The tools are there, the work has been done, but let's not stop there. Slave labor in Brazil is the thin end of the wedge. At the broad end are farm workers, tens of millions of them. This community has earned its reputation for innovation in the name of inclusion of smallholder farmers. As a result of your efforts over the last quarter century, smallholders participate in coffee's promise in a way that would have been unimaginable a generation ago. But farm workers have generally been outside of those efforts. Renewing the specialty brand will begin to help tens of millions of people, the most vulnerable people in our supply chains, begin to join in specialty coffee's promise in a way that smallholders do. Almost 60 years ago, a young African-American minister who would soon become pastor of a church a little more than a mile from here wrote these words. When he did, he was borrowing from wisdom that was over a century old from Theodore Parker, an American transcendentalist and relevant to the context of this conversation, a leading abolitionist. The arc of the moral universe is long and our eyes see but little way. We cannot calculate the curve or complete the figure by the experience of sight we can divine it by conscience, and it seems to bend toward justice. Did Brazil overreach in its definition of slavery? Maybe. Was it sloppy in its application of the dirty list? Maybe. Were inspectors for the Special Mobile Inspection Group ham-handed, as I've heard from several growers in the room? Maybe. Were they wrong? I don't know. Each one of those pieces of regulation that I mentioned serves as a mirror set up at the farthest point we can see on that arc, and they serve to extend our vision. We don't have to rely just on conscience. We're having these values, this acute intolerance of slavery or anything that looks like slavery reflected back to us through those mirrors. The CNN Freedom Project next door has been taking on this issue for years. It's not just in the legal world, it's in the social world, and it's in the world of our consumers as reflected by the research presented to us today. In the 19th century, Brazil's coffee barons dragged their feet on abolition. They're on the wrong side of history. Today, Brazil is ahead of the curve. To me, that sounds like progress. And I think it's a worthy effort for us to join in the specialty community. Thank you.